Carlos Castaneda, Journey to Ixtlan, Introduction, Part 2. Don Juan and I had been talking about different things in a relaxed and unstructured manner. I told him about a friend of mine and his dilemma with his nine-year-old son. The child, who had been living with the mother for the past four years, was then living with my friend, and the problem was what to do with him. According to my friend, the child was a misfit in school. He lacked concentration and was not interested in anything. He was given to tantrums, disruptive behavior, and to running away from home. Your friend certainly does have a problem. There is no need to say any more about that poor little boy. There is no need for you or for me to regard his actions in our thoughts one way or another. What can my friend do? The worst thing he could do is to force that child to agree with him. What do you mean? I mean that that child shouldn't be spanked or scared by his father when he doesn't behave the way he wants him to. How can he teach him anything if he isn't firm with him? Your friend should let someone else spank the child. Don Juan's suggestion surprised me. He can't let anyone touch him with a finger. Your friend is not a warrior. If he were, he would know that the worst thing one can do is to confront human beings bluntly. And what does a warrior do in such cases, Don Juan? A warrior proceeds strategically. I still don't understand what you mean. I mean that if your friend were a warrior, he would help his child to stop the world. How can my friend do that? He would need personal power. He would need to be a sorcerer. But he isn't. In that case, he must use ordinary means to help his son to change his idea of the world. It is not stopping the world, but it will work just the same. Can you explain it to me in more detail? If I were your friend, I would start by hiring someone to spank the little guy. I would go to Skid Row and hire the worst-looking man I could find. To scare a little boy? Surely you. Just scaring in this case is not enough. That little fellow must be stopped, and being beaten by his father won't do it. If one wants to stop our fellow men, one must always be outside the circle that presses them. That way, one can always direct the pressure. The idea was preposterous, but somehow it was appealing to me. Tell me more about what my friend should do with his little boy. Tell him to go to Skid Row and very carefully select an ugly-looking derelict. Tell him to get a young one, one who still has some strength left in him. Don Juan then laid out a rather strange strategy for my friend to follow. What he needs to do is this, to have the man follow him or wait for him at a place where he would go with his son. The man, in response to a pre-arranged cue to be given after any objectionable behavior on the part of the child, was supposed to leap from a hiding place, pick the child up, and spank the living daylights out of him. After the man scares him, your friend must help the little boy regain his confidence in any way he can. If he follows this procedure three or four times, I assure you that that child will feel differently towards everything. He will change his idea of the world. What if the fright injures him? Won't it cripple the psyche? Fright never injures anyone. What injures the spirit is having someone always on your back, beating you, telling you what to do and what not to do. When that boy is more contained, you must tell your friend to do one last thing for him. He must find some way to get to a dead child, perhaps in a hospital or the morgue. He must take his son there and show the dead child to him. He must let him touch the corpse once with his left hand, on any place except the corpse's belly. After the boy does that, he will be renewed. The world will never be the same for him. I realized then that throughout the years of our association, Don Juan had been employing with me, although on a different scale, the same tactics he was suggesting my friend should use with his son. I asked him if that was the case. I've tried to teach you how to stop the world from the beginning. You haven't yet. Nothing seems to work because you are very stubborn. If you were less stubborn, however, by now, you would probably have stopped the world with any of the techniques I have taught you. What techniques, Don Juan? Everything I have told you to do, 
was a technique for stopping the world. A few months after that conversation, Don Juan accomplished what he had set out to do, to teach me to stop the world. This event was one of the turning points in my life. It forced me to re-examine everything that had taken place during my 10 years of education. It became evident to me that my original assumption about the role of psychotropic plants was erroneous. They were not the essential feature of the sorcerer's description of the world, but were only an aid to cement, so to speak, parts of the description which I had been incapable of perceiving otherwise. It was simply a character trait that I was unable to perceive these parts without the help of plants. My insistence on holding on to my standard version of reality rendered me almost deaf and blind to Don Juan's aims. Therefore, it was simply my lack of sensitivity which had fostered their use. Don Juan stated that in order to arrive at seeing, one first had to stop the world. Stopping the world was indeed an appropriate rendition of certain states of awareness in which the reality of everyday life is altered because the flow of interpretation, which ordinarily runs uninterruptedly, has been stopped by a set of circumstances alien to that flow. In my case, the set of circumstances alien to my normal flow of interpretations was the sorcery description of the world. After stopping the world, the next step was seeing. By that, Don Juan meant what I would like to categorize as responding to the perceptual solicitations of a world outside the description we have learned to call reality. 